Warning. The following program contains stories and images that may be unsuitable for younger audiences. The purpose of this program is not to glorify violence or death, but to share the experiences of American citizens who answered their nation's call. Viewer discretion is advised. World War II. It was the largest and deadliest conflict in human history. Approximately 70 million lives across the globe were lost. Not one nation was free from its economic, social, or political effects. Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan sought to conquer this world. While several nations took part in trying to stop their goal, Great Britain, the United States, and the Soviet Union would help drive the fight from their own homelands and territories to the homelands of the Axis powers. From beach fighting to urban warfare and death camps, a 25-year-old private witnessed it all. He was there for the D-Day invasion. He spent his 25th birthday at the Battle of the Bulge, and he looked on in horror at the masses of dead prisoners from Hitler's final solution. These are things the average teenager or 20-something could not imagine in today's world. However, for men like Raymond Clark of Lake City, Arkansas, he had to keep moving forward. Despite all that faced him and being wounded twice to which he received two Purple Hearts and the Bronze Star he received for Valor, there are even things 70 years later he still won't talk about. Listen to Private Clark as he shares what he is willing to talk about with his hopes that young people today will never forget the sacrifices his generation made for our freedoms on this edition of Arkansas Valor. I started out in the uh anti-aircraft, 90 millimeter guns, and the, the boys in the infantry couldn't take the infantry, so they took us out of the anti-aircraft and put us in the infantry, swapped. <laughs> and uh, I think we got, I think we got the uh, worst end of the deal, but anyway, we, I survived but the most of those who I trained with did not survive. I was in the infantry division. The uh, seven out of three died. Only, I mean, seven out of ten died, excuse me. And uh, they just left three that survived out of ten people that, were, that we went into the infantry. And that was, it's kind of sad after you train with someone and live with them. And then they, they're talking to them one time and the next time they're dead, just in the next second, right by the side of you. And you wonder how could you escape? And the only thing that I could say was there was a higher power. It was certainly a, a, not a pleasant thing, but it was necessary. They did tell us that when we fought World War II, that would end the war. But I think it just began, because I don't think we've had any any place, some place in the country there's been some kind of a uprising since then, and there still is. I uh, I got that letter from Uncle Sam. Said greetings from the president, and then they, I went and examined. I was examined, and they uh, passed me. And uh, I went in at Camp Robinson. Was inducted in the army down there, 
and I was shipped to Fort Bliss, Texas, into anti aircraft. And uh, I served as uh, a loader for the 90 millimeters gun. And first, they had those old uh, shells, and they, they don't have them now, but those shells was about that long. And I, when they'd elevate that gun up, you'd have to take your, get down like this and push them in, and that was a job. But I managed to do it, and then they uh, took me off of that and put me on a, what they call a fuse range setter for the anti-aircraft. The anti-aircraft, uh, we had to, they would feed me the information, how high it was, how fast they was going, and I'd set the fuse on that shell to go off at that certain height, and then I'd load the gun. And then that was our, my job until they transferred us to the infantry. And then they trained us a few weeks in the infantry. We loaded on the USS, USS Wakefield, landed in Liverpool, England, and uh, immediately they didn't hesitate. They put us on a landing craft to take us across the English Channel. And we got out there and the submarines got after us. <laughs> and uh, it looked like the ship was going to sink because they stationed guards, you know, at the open doorways that killed you where you could get out. That thing was holler inside and where they could put a, a platoon in them things. And uh, <coughs> they were shooting the guns, little guns they had on there, but then the aircraft... English aircraft and American aircraft was above, and they was they chased those submarines away before, before they could sink us. But anyway, we made it across, went immediately to the front line, and uh, we fought all the way through. I'm telling you, and it was rough. got to Bonn, Germany, and we were supposed to take the town, and uh, we were supposed to do it, and then orders come through to immediately, as fast as we could, to go to Cologne, Germany, and there we took that railroad bridge, and I know they made a movie of it, in uh, Remagen Bridge. And that, uh, that was something that I, I don't know, I'll never forget. Whole platoons of us dis disappeared, died. They shot us down. And uh, I guess I was one of the three that survived. But the platoons were just, they, just see, they were dead, laying all over the ground, everywhere. And that, uh, the lady asked me from the VA out here in Jonesboro, said, did you see any dead people? I said, lady, I've seen so many people dead and so thick, so many that you could almost walk on them. And I said, that's, it, it's had its effect. Sometimes I wonder <laughs> whether I'm going to make it now or not. But uh, then we were in the 9th Division. I was in the 47th Regiment, 1st Platoon, which was a rifle platoon at that time. And we were on the front line, and we fought all the way through. Uh, after we crossed 
the, took that bridge there at Cologne. Then we went on and I was almost to Berlin and it stopped us. We met the Russians there and we had a little talk and General Eisenhower or the president, one of them stopped us and we wanted to take Berlin, but they wouldn't let us. They wanted to, the Russians took it. I'll never forget the, the bulge. That was something else. When the, how how we survived, what few of us did, I don't know. See that the Hitler, and uh, pushed in on us, there and just bulged in a in a bulge in our lines. And he captured a bunch of us, and uh, they pulled us, lined us up there, and orders come through to that German commander from Hitler, said, don't take prisoners, kill them. Said, we ain't got time to fool with, with the prisoners. Said, kill them. And they backed three trucks up there and they had a curtain hanging down on the back of the little GI trucks. And when they, they lined them up, and when they raised a curtain on the back of that, and, and the machine guns was in each truck, and they just mowed us down. It, it's not pleasant to talk about. When you see them, your butt is just shot down right by the side of you. I did it for the country. I did it because of those who were coming after me. The United States hadn't ended the war. In fact, uh, Churchill, Winston Churchill said they'd lost it if we didn't. They were gone. We lost 10,000 boys in the invasion of France at D-Day. And that German general, we learned later, I think we captured him, and he said when he looked out where he could see that morning that we invaded, invaded, said all he could see was ships. Said, man, they were ships everywhere. And then the order was given to Take, take that, and we all were in the landing bits, landing boats, and there was a high cliff. I mean, just a straight up cliff. And uh, they, we was down below, and they was up above, because we didn't have a chance. But anyway, we made it up there, climbed that cliff, went around, and uh, chased them out. They had a bunch of pill boxes, what we call pill boxes. They were round dome things uh, made out of thick concrete, reinforced with steel, and uh, they had a a slit in it where the gun could, you know, could operate like that. And uh, the, you could have to slip up there and uh, get under that where the slit was. They couldn't see you under there, and all it, pulled a gr pin on your grenade and right up and throw it through that slit. <laughs> that was that was something. That, and then we caught, had what we call the hedgerow fighting. That was they had a bunch of hedges over there to hold the ground, keep it from blowing away, and they had hedges planted to stop it. And we'd go from hedge to hedge, fight from hedge to hedge. And we call it the hedgerow fighting. And uh, we got up to Cologne after, you know, after they pulled us all away from Bonn, they pulled us up to Cologne. And uh, we were there and this little boy was scared. He was so scared, he, he was, well, he was about to panic. And the fellow on my right said, if he turns and looks at you, said, shoot him. I said, I can't do that. That's, that's one of us. 
He said, uh, if you don't shoot him, he's going to shoot you. Said if he looks at and he's and uh, said he's scared and he's panicking and he'll shoot you. And uh, fortunately, he didn't look at me, <laughs> but I watched him. And uh, all at once, he yelled and a piece of shrapnel and he had his canteen here on his right side on that belt, <laughs> and it went through his canteen. And just barely, it just made a red spot on him. And he yelled, I'm hit, I'm hit. And I, and I thought, Lord God, you ain't hit, you just been scared. <laughs> anyway, I went on through to the hills, the other side of the River Rhine, and uh, we were ordered to take high ground. And... Uh, we started and I didn't make it. They got me. <laughs> it went in here and just, the doctor said it dismissed my heart about that much. I think it was Almighty God because he said, you're lucky. He said, it's just a hair over and you wouldn't have been here. So it's still in there. They didn't take it out. It's too close. They won't mess with it. So I still carry it. And I, that's why we had the supper. We waded rivers and mountains, slept in mud, water, ice, wake up, waded, we waded the Earth River in Germany, and it was in February, and ice and snow everywhere. And that was the month that was the worst storm that it, in a hundred years of, of Germany in that area, it was a hundred years since there had been that bad a storm. It was snow and ice everywhere. You had to sleep in it. That is, if you could. <laughs> and uh, I woke up a many morning with them ice sickles, you know, pushed the ground up all around. <clears throat> and you could sleep because you could, you were so tired. We didn't get any rest. We waited that river that night at about it was about one o'clock. Ice and snow everywhere, and uh, ice coming down that river. And the only comical thing I guess you could call it that we had a little out little boy named Conchaba in our outfit <laughs> and he had some kind of a foot trouble that his feet that was the stinkingest little feet I ever smelled <laughs> and in training we'd threaten said if you don't go wash them feet we're going to wash them with a GI brush you know just, of course we uh, yeah I guess we would have but anyway we made it through and uh, he was coming, he went in, he jumped in the river just above me, and he went under. And he come up screaming, I'm drowning, I'm drowning. And every time he'd scream, the machine guns would just tear us up. And uh, I grabbed him. He come by, and I grabbed him. That river was swift. And I grabbed him and held him up. And got him to the other side, and I was yelling at him to shut your mouth, you're going to get us all killed. <laughs> and he just, he kept screaming. He, he was scared, he was panicked, what it was, he just was panicked. And that, uh, I got him across, but I said one thing, he got his feet washed that night. <laughs> the only rest we would get was when we waded that river and then the Germans stopped us before we could take that little town across the river and we laid on the railroad dump. The railroad went through town and we laid out on that railroad dump with wet clothes on with uh, weather, I guess, down around zero. And uh, froze. I froze there. And the next morning 
I when I rather when daylight come, I grown men was crying because they getting to move a little bit, and you know when you thaw it out, how if you ever been froze, you know what I'm talking about. Oh, your hands get cold, tingle, you know. And they were crying, boy, they cried, and they let us rest that day, and brought and uh, dry our clothes. And about that time, they'd stick their head in and say, get ready, we're moving out. I heard that a lot of time. And then we went again. We didn't, that one day, we are just on the front. And uh, the commanders was hollering at the higher ups that we were so tired, we couldn't hardly make it. But they kept pushing us. But we, and then we went on to uh, over the river, and I went, I think, and we took a little town, got in these woods, and uh, they ordered us to take a high ground, which was just a little, it wasn't really a mountain, but it was a high hill. And we started, and about the time we got started, well, they hit me and I fell, and they stopped the blood, put a press bandage on it, and, and all of that. And medics got got me back and uh, loaded me in an ambulance, along with a bunch. Well, it was loaded with wounded and uh, sick. That uh, I guess. When, you know, the shock finally hit me, and a lot of the boys died from shock. And it hit me, and I thought, well, here, this is it. I was in the ambulance, and a little, we had a colored boy driving the ambulance, and somebody, I was trying to vomit, and I couldn't. And uh, the uh, boy said, was laying there next, uh, just above me in that ambulance. He called up at that old driver and said, this boy's got to vomit. He said, that old boy said, I can't stop. He said, I've got to keep this thing moving. He said, just tell him to use his helmet. <laughs> and that's what I, I'll tell you. And uh, I had a, the only thing that I, Remember, they gave me a shot of uh, morphine or something. I don't know what it was, some kind of something. Kind of nulled that pain down. And I had a, a bill, my billfold, and we had what we called uh, D rations, and it had a cellophane cover to it. And I had one of them, I put my wallet in there and put it in this pocket on a fatigue jacket and buttoned the button up here. And they cut that off from me, and I never, I never did get my milk wallet. I think them boys out at the aid station got it. I had money in it. I had American money, had Belgian money, oh French money. I had a bunch of, you know, just for souvenirs, a lot of it. I mean, I never just seen it before. Somebody got it. We went in to take them, run the Germans out, some of, and uh, one of them, they had a, you've seen these cotton trailers here in this country, and they had a trailer there, something like that, and it had just piled up with dead bodies. I mean, way up high, that it was going to burn. And uh, at one they had a trench dug, looked like it took a bulldozer and just dug a big, wide, deep trench. And they'd bring these Jews in there and uh, they'd gas a lot of them after they'd take all their teeth, knock their teeth out. If they had gold, they'd get that gold off of their teeth. And if they had tattoos, they'd take it and cut the skin, cut that part of it off 
and make lampshades out of out of it. And I know a lot of people in America don't, they wouldn't believe that, but it's true. And uh, the, uh, they, what they would do, they had a German machine gunner sitting on the end up here, and this end of that trench was open. And they'd march those people around there and bring them in, <coughs> excuse me, bring them in that inn, walk them up there and shoot them down. Bring another low, uh, group in and they'd have to walk over them and some of them wasn't dead, but they'd walk over them and shoot them down. And they'd fill it. And uh, now how we know that, we they uh, captured a film that the Germans had took of, of that going on. And it showed that German machine gunner sitting up there on that uh, end of that trench smoking a cigarette. This is like nothing's happening. And he was mowing them poor people down like cutting hay. And, and it, it's, when we took them camps, they wouldn't let us go in to that barracks, you know, where they had them housed because they were afraid there was some kind of disease, you know, we could take it. And uh, they were just skeletons. Their eyes were just sunk back in their head, just dead. Just, they were just dead. And uh, they just skeletons. <clears throat> and they wouldn't let us go in there. They wouldn't let them come out because they wanted to examine them, the doctors, the medics did, before they'd let us go in, to, you know, into the barracks. Right. And uh, <laughs> it, it, it's something that burned in your brain. And I've heard people say, you know, big, smart, mostly smart people say, oh, that didn't happen. But these two eyes seen it. They know. And that it did happen. And it's terrible to think about. And of course, they got a, a museum now in Jerusalem whereby you can see that. They have them, them incinerators. They, I, they had, I had a picture of them, and I've lost them somewhere of them incinerators where they'd burn them. And uh, what they would do to a lot of them, they had rooms and they'd run gas lines in the ceilings, look like sprinklers in a, in a building, you know, water sprinklers. And uh, they'd tell them, we're gonna take, you gotta take a bath. And they'd get in there and and when they all got in there, <coughs> then they'd turn that gas on them, gas them, and then take them up, put them in the refrigerator, I mean in it, incinerators, burn them. Babies, children, grown people, all of them. And uh, it would get so mad, it'd make you so mad that you'd just lose almost reasoning to think that people could be that cruel, but they can. It made me know that there's so much evil in the world, and that's why I wanted, I, I, one of the reasons, I know God called me to preach, and that's one of the reasons that I did go, preach, because I'd seen the suffering, and seen the pain, and seen them skeleton people like that, and people dead all over the ground. Our boys, streaked just all over the ground, dead. Just about every town we took, you could almost walk on the dead. And I've seen so much death, and then I got to reading the Bible, <coughs> and it tells us of a better place. And I believed that. 
and uh, that's one one of the reasons why that I went to preaching because I just wanted to help people and help them to live right. Tell them, you know, I can't make them live right. Wouldn't try. It's because God made us a free moral agent, and we can choose which way to go. But I wanted to tell them that of the better way, and that's what that's why. Well, to the generation of young people, which now they're different than the generation that I come up in. It's a different generation. And uh, I would suggest to them to go to church and uh, be faithful to that church and, you know, not be like the kind of people I've been talking about because they could be led, if they get in the wrong crowd, they could be led wrong into the dope habit or other habits. When I think of this, that baby, let me remind you one more thing. Uh, there was a farmhouse in over there, and uh, we took this going through there and in this farmhouse was an old was a young woman she had a little baby and she was dead had been shot and that little baby was trying to to uh, suck her breast and her dead and you talk about killing somebody in the soul boy and that's why I suggest to the young people, live right, treat other people like you want to be treated, and love them and help them all you can with any way you can. I'd say I suggest that's the best way to do it, is to come to God. Thank you for watching Arkansas Valor. This documentary was produced by T Ward Media, and I am humbled and honored to be able to bring you these stories of our veterans that you will not find in history books. Preserving history has always been important to me, and through Arkansas Valor, I am able to secure these stories and our fragile history for preservation for future generations. Their stories of sacrifice, bravery, and honor will be remembered throughout time because of their willingness to speak. And if you or someone you know wants to be a part of Arkansas Valor and tell their story, please contact us at the information below. Lastly, we would like to thank all of our veterans, past, present, and future, for your honor, courage, and sacrifices. Without you, this series and our freedoms would not be possible. God bless you all, and thank you for watching 
Arkansas Valor.